yourself into a human I can depend on to bring me happy. Welcome aboard. This is a captain's log. I'm Brian Kreutz. She's the lovable, lyrically and linguistically super talented Lily Fox Lem. Thank you. Now, plus somewhere on a lower deck is the abominable, but sometimes adorable animated android Raj. Captain's log. Spoken by William Shatner were the first two words viewers heard on the first Star Trek broadcast. The episode was titled The Man Trap. September of 1966, by the way. Now, as many captains would robustly read their captain's log aboard a Federation starship, it's the order to go to warp speed, then engage, that would stir our curiosity of what's in store for the next episode of Weekly Star Trek. Yes, and that feeling is shared by many of us Star Trek fans, regardless of who the captain is conducting on their crew or course correcting. Updates to the captain's log and setting a course time and again meant the adventure is just beginning to take shape. Yes, it is. Let's see what's out there. Engage. The adventure is continuing to an intense crescendo before our half-hour conclusion of Star Trek stories as we have part two of our interview with Scott McDonald. Bass? Lily? <gasps> Did you both know that Scott McDonald played Officer Michael Minden in an episode of Boston Legal on ABC Network Television with William Shatner, who is famous for playing Captain Kirk? And Rene Aubergeois, who is known as playing Odo. Nice, Raj. You pulled that one out of your Android archives, and that was the same episodes that they were all in together, mm -hmm. it sounds like. Well, Star Trek has made a mark on many actors throughout their careers. Scott McDonald, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Scott shared last week with us that he did indeed begin his first two television appearances as an actor on Star Trek. In fact, his first two roles ever were on the TV series Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Star Trek The Next Generation. Aha! Uh -huh. Scott also appeared on TV right after his two Star Trek roles in Law and Order. Da -da. He played Brown in an episode in 1994, and that was with Star Trek guest star Carolyn McCormick, who played Riker's favorite holodeck lady and mate in his mind named Minuet. Raj, you're still babbling. It's season three here on A Captain's Log. Surely by now, like Mr. Data, you should have learned not to babble. <laughs> <laughs> Love the Picard voice you do always. <laughs> Thank you. Now for our new segment this week, we're doing a wave of commentary that should give you a nice rush of perspective and well-conceived opinions of our review from our writer Carl Koshis on Star Trek Strange New World, season one to be specific. Now, now that it's complete, we're all eyeing season two coming up to us soon here in 2023. Yes, and there's lots to recap. BK, you and I happen to completely agree with our writer Carl's perspective on this iteration of Trek. Oh, we do, yes. Now, Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry visited our writer Carl's creative writing class back in 1971, and to no surprise, Carl was a fan of Star Trek ever since. Wow, Carl met the legendary Roddenberry? <laughs> Now, Strange New Worlds is near the top of my list as the best series, and yours as well, Brian. Yes. Carl writes, of all the 13 feature films and 11 Star Trek TV shows that are series, this is absolutely the finest evolution, a pinnacle of achievement, since Spock first put on his pointy ears. But that's another story. What makes Strange New Worlds so good? Everything. Cast, crew, script, improved super graphics. But most of all, we have Captain Pike, who knows he's gonna die a horrible death in 10 years into the future, and not to mention a resourceful and foolhardy Captain Kirk's brother as a young lieutenant with a mustache on Pike's Enterprise. Oh yeah, that's right. William Shatner played George Samuel Kirk. William Shatner was basically laying on the ground, lying dead on the floor in that original series episode titled 
uh, Operation Annihilate. It was right. the last one of season uh, Yeah, season that one. was him. Mm -hmm. And like Shatner, who was born in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, the new Sam Kirk is played by fellow Montreal native, actor Daniel Junot in Strange New Worlds, mustache included. <laughs> and like Pike, is he doomed to die for the original series? Gosh, I guess if it's not set in the Kelvin universe, it, he has to follow the same time plan, right? So we'll look for that death. Now, my favorite character is Chief Engineer Hemmer, an Anar, played by Bruce Horak. Now, Hemmer's uh, low-key humor and sophisticated mind, while also being blind, to me is very Star Trek worthy of being one of the greatest regular cast members and integral to this Enterprise crew success. All right, so, Lily, let's get back to the review here of uh, what Carl had wrote. Other standouts in the cast of Star Trek Strange New Worlds is Christina Chong as Chief of Security Lieutenant Lon Noonien Singh. That name kind of sounds familiar, mm, right? It does. <laughs> Con! <laughs> her ambiguous presence makes us wonder who she really is, and her absolute dedication to her job is really a marvel to watch. As the first episode opens, we find Lon Noonien Singh acting as uh, Captain Pike's number one. Now, she has a commanding presence to her acting. Likewise, her number one played by actress Rebecca Romaine, who not only reminds us of the need for a strong woman presence on the bridge, but she nails it in her charisma. Next, we have Celia Rose Gooding, who plays Cadet Uhura. Now, Gooding dials in a tremendous performance on her first away mission, then uses her singing voice to continue the tradition that Nichelle Nichols started the original Star Trek series. <laughs> so cool. And another exciting new face is actress Melissa Navia as the helmsman of the Enterprise. Back at the Academy, Ortegas would brag that she was going to be the best pilot to ever graduate. Well, she's pretty good, and she proves it to Pike and his crew time and time again already in this new series, Strange New Worlds. Yes. Pike hears about Ortega's boasting about her piloting skills and needs her to deliver a defensive maneuver to save the Enterprise, which she pulls off flawlessly. <laughs> And of course, no new Star Trek series would be complete without a new Mr. Spock. Yes. Sliding effortlessly into one of the major iconic roles of the 20th century, and so comes Ethan Peck, grandson of legendary actor Gregory Peck. Ethan Spock is less mechanical, less, I'm Mr. Spock. <laughs> Peck is superb as a new type of Spock. Gosh, it's hard to replace the original Nimoy, but my it goodness. Is. Ethan Peck is really amazing. Can't wait to see new episodes of this coming up in season two. So many excellent Spock moments, and Pike for that matter, also in the next feature, Star Trek Into Darkness, which was a film that thoroughly deserved another chapter in this legacy. Absolutely, it did. That was the, the 12th Star Trek film. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Welcome back to A Captain's Log. Lily and I continue part two in our interview with the one and only Scott McDonald. <laughs> Scott McDonald. BK, last week we discussed Scott's early career and his start in his first two TV roles as the Romulan sub-commander Nevek in The Next Generation and I Am Tosk. <laughs> you know, the Emmy award-winning makeup for that was made for his character Tosk on Deep Space Nine. Yeah, I did read that. That's impressive. Now, fans, be sure to check out part one of that and let's continue here on a Captain's Log with part two of our interview. Well, Scott, you've had a long career in Hollywood with many roles in between Star Trek. However, your next television role in the early 90s was consecutively in order immediately after Deep Space Nine. Now, this role you're playing is the one that Lily alluded to earlier, the Romulan role of sub-commander Nevek from the superb Next Generation episode, a Deanna Troy episode, by the way, <laughs> Face of the Enemy. Tell us some of the memories from the set and also the audition process and knowing you're getting this role so quickly after your last one on Star Trek. I was playing Tosk. I was on set of Deep Space Nine and they brought me a script for Next Generation to that set. Two o'clock in the morning or something like that, my last day. So I got home about four o'clock in the morning and I had to go back to Paramount Studios at 1030 in the morning to audition for Nivek. Wow. I was really tired and really nervous and didn't feel like I knew the lines well enough. So I was holding that script in my hand and usually I was pretty good back in those days of memorizing, but... uh uh, and it was a lot of techno babble. It was that big scene where I was talking about, I have a comrade who's in engineering and Nivek was all into the Spock reunification and he was working for the underground. So there was this element of him 
I mean, Romulans are already uptight <laughs> right. to begin with. Their whole existence is uptightness. Yeah. So I had to be uptight on top of being uptight, I thought. Yeah. And uh, uh, I actually said that line in the room when we finished. The guy said, that was pretty good, this and that and the other thing. How can we played it this way? How can we played it that way? And I said, well, and I said that about, my, you know, and they kind of chuckled. Uh, and then I booked that and uh, shot it. Uh, the, I, can't, I think I started that Friday. So I shot back to back. I was on the lot for Deep Space Nine, and then uh, literally the next week, I was on the lot for Star Trek The Next Generation. And there was a massive dichotomy because the Deep Space Nine was just starting out, so they were greasing the gears and moving slow, and there was a lot of holdups and weights and things while they were trying to sort stuff out on that show, and next generation was a well-oiled machine it was fast and if you didn't know your lines you were holding things up and time is money and you know it was kind of nerve-wracking but that again was a great experience and again i got really lucky that's a really well-written episode it is it was i really the first time they really gave marina the ball you mm -hmm. know and i've heard through the years it's it's one of her favorite episodes oh it is really uh-huh i've heard that and uh um and you know she's very good in it i think and uh and carolyn seymour played my captain yes exactly. uh and she is another star trek veteran who's played a whole bunch of stuff and just a really really great lady and we became good friends over the years we used to sit together at uh sci-fi conventions Oh, really? Because we had that episode together, and I, there, we used to have a picture of us at that dinner table sitting together that we would sign, sort of co-sign together, you know, when we were at these conventions. And uh, uh, so it was really great. Uh, Gabrielle Beaumont was the director of that one, and she was a Brit. Carolyn Seymour is a Brit. Marina is a Brit. <laughs> I'm not a Brit, so I wasn't in the club. Uh, they would get together and kibitz and talk and giggle and laugh. And so I was a little bit of an outsider in that regard on that show. I said to Marina, I don't want to create a big stir here or be the apologizing actor, but I got told all the wrong pages last night by a PA who called me. So I, I'm, I'm ready to perform the scenes I was told. And Marina to her eternal glory in my mind, said, all right, everything stops. God damn it. Same, same thing happened to Scott that happened to me. Got the wrong pages. I just got lucky because I don't have that much to say. We're taking a break. We're going to go take a half hour. We're going to learn these lines. Somebody did something wrong here, and it wasn't either one of the actors. And we went off to the side and we studied lines for a half an hour. And after that, the rest of the day went really smooth. So to, to her eternal credit as a series regular, she laid the law down and really took care of us both. But I was panicking because I had sort of walked on water and been a hero as tossed. Yeah. They were just loving me over there the week before. And then all of a sudden I was in trouble on day one. Uh, and you know, it's my second guest star ever. So, you know, <laughs> You know, I had I was inexperienced and just trying to hit my marks and give a good performance. Scott, I can only assume, based upon your answer earlier, that you're thrilled to be playing a human with no makeup on Star Trek in that role of Tactical Officer Rollins from the beginning of Voyager, your next Star Trek role. Can you please share how all of this came to pass? Lieutenant Rollins was in the pilot, and uh, I've been told... I'm the only non-series regular to run the bridge of a starship on my own. Because Rollins does in that episode. Rollins is alone up there. They all beam down to do stuff. And I'm they're asking me questions, what's going on? And I'm answering them. And I'm alone on that bridge. That's right. You know, in my opinion, it's one of the largest errors in the Star Trek canon. Because Rollins disappears errors really 
It's an error. Yeah. I mean, where did he go? Because they're knocked out into space. There's right. no chance that there was turnover and he went to a different ship or anything. Where'd he go? They didn't kill him, you know? So I, I always used to go to conventions. I mean, people would ask, how come there's no more Rollins? What's going on in the books that they write? Rollins is in there. How come no, you know, and I thought, look, talk to the writers. I don't know. I would have gladly gone back. Uh, so in my opinion, it's a little bit of a mistake to have not done something with him, not explained why Rollins just flat disappeared. I was in the only footage with jean via Bougeau. Oh, really? When she was the captain. Mm -hmm. And it turned into a really long pilot shoot because of that. They started with her and we worked for a while and we shot some stuff and then she quit. And then there was a wait and uh, it was quite a while. Uh, where we waited before we shot again. And then uh, one day they called us all to set and we all put our stuff on and we all got to set and we were all on set waiting. And it was like, oh, who's it going to be? Who's the new captain going to be? And nobody came. And we all got sent home. And then about four days later, same thing happened again. We all went and we all signed up and everything. And here came Kate Mulgrew and... Uh, she just took charge. It was impressive because Bougeot was uncomfortable and she didn't, she wasn't comfortable. She was not like a captain. She was halting and quiet and whispery and she was not comfortable. She wasn't, she didn't enjoy the experience. A captain's log returns in a moment. Welcome back to A Captain's Log. Lily and I are continuing our two-part interview with the talented Scott McDonald. Well, Scott, you're back in the same year in 1995 in Star Trek. This time, a second appearance for you in Star Trek Deep Space Nine into heavy makeup as the Jem'Hadar character Goran Agar. And you're the only Jem'Hadar survivor. What was this role like playing a spot opposite Alexander Siddig as Bashir and Cole Meany as O'Brien in a very revealing episode for the species that you were playing? I was gone a lot. And they called the house. My agents called and said they want to see you at Paramount Studios. And I said, well, I can't go till Monday. Well, they want, they, they want to talk to you about a job. And I said, great. I'm in Fort Lauderdale. I can't come. I'm shooting a commercial out here. I'll, I'll be home on Monday and I'll go down there. And uh, apparently they called a few more times that same week saying, why won't he come in here? And uh, then I went in and uh, just as I was walking out the door, uh, they had these little kind of pop-ups that um, had the picture of the Bud Light ladies on them that would be stand-up sitting in bars on table, bar tables and stuff like that of us. So I just, just I don't know why I grabbed it, lucky I did, threw it in my back pocket and um, got down there and I walked in the door and Ira Stephen Bear uh, was there and Renee Bergeron was there and a couple other people were there. And I walked in the door all excited to be back on the lot at Paramount and talk about Star Trek. And uh, Ira said, you're a hard guy to get a hold of. Ooh. Yeah. Right as I came in the door, no hello, no nothing. And uh, I said, no, I, I said, I replied to every my agent called me and I replied to every one of them. I was unavailable. I was, I was shooting a commercial. I was out in Fort Lauderdale uh, and doing, I've been doing personal appearances all over America. I just luckily have a little window right now of a couple of weeks before I go do more of it. So I'm here. If I wasn't available, I wouldn't come in. And uh, well, what are you doing? He says, he's legitimately mad at me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Renee is furtively looking at him and looking at me awkwardly and uh and i don't know what renee's doing there and uh so i took that thing out of my back pocket and said well here it is i'm the pretty one and it was all these the four of us in our dresses and uh you know just wearing wigs and stupid outfits and it's just four big dumb guys who figured out a way to get half price beer that's all it is <laughs> and uh he starts laughing and says oh that's kind of funny and everything and so it kind of broke that tension yeah uh, and then renee said uh we have a role that we're interested in having you play but it's a lot of makeup again and uh we were wondering if you'd be willing 
to do it. And uh, I said, what is it? And he said, it's a Jem Hadar. And I said, oh, I know those. I know the Jem Hadar. I watch Deep Space Nine. I know those guys. And they said, yeah, but th this one's different. This is the first Jem Hadar who's going to talk a lot. And we're worried because it's a lot of makeup. It's a lot of dialogue. And Renee said a wonderful thing. They were looking around. They were talking about who should do it. And Renee said, I'm told, what about the guy who played Tosk? So that was very flattering and fun. And sure. uh, so I said, oh, of course I would do it. Are you kidding? A chance to be on Star Trek again? And, you know, I, I said, I'll, I'll call Anheuser Bush and tell them I can't do it for these eight days, whenever your eight days are. I, I want to do your show. So I went in and everybody in the Deep Space Nine cast was in my trailer when oh, I God. opened the door and walked in there and except Avery. Really? Well, that has to make you feel really good, Scott. Oh, so cool. It was so cool. So nice. Calm, Calm was just as gracious. He was the only one who had seen me. Mm -hmm. Calm took me out for drinks after we finished Tosk. Uh, there used to be a bar right down there on the lot at Paramount. I can't think of the name of it anymore. It's gone now. But he said, come over here after you're done. And I said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get out of this stuff. But I got there and Corey Allen was there and Colm was there. Everybody else had gone home. And uh, so I had a couple of drinks with those two guys after we got done, which is a great memory for me. And again, that was a great storyline. I mean, this the first Jim Hadar off the Ketracel White. He's the first Jim Hadar with a conscience not on this drug that the Vorta put in him so I had a lot of room like I did with Tosk to invent because no Jim Hadar had ever experienced that before uh, and so once again very very fortunate got a really incredibly well written episode uh, where once again the prime directive is in play and Bashir is up against it because it's the Hippocratic Oath. You know, he kind of has to help. And uh, it was really good. And the reason Rene was there is Rene Abergenois directed the episode. Oh, he did? Okay. That's why, why don't we get the guy who played Tosk? So that's the first episode of Deep Space Nine that Rene Abergenois directed. So he was a little nervous. Rene and the, fir and the uh, first assistant director uh, and uh, Marvin Rush, the director of photography, and uh, and they're talking and they're pointing and they're saying some things like that. And then they'd say, they'd turn the fans off and say, okay, are we ready? And we'd go again. And then they'd say, cut, cut. And they'd turn the fans back on as soon as we'd cut. And then they were over there talking and everything and everything, you know. And finally, after about the third take, Rene comes up to me and he's angry. Hmm. Do you have a problem with what I'm telling you to do? And I said... What are you telling me to do? I can't hear anything with the fans on. You've been in this gear. I, what, are, what are you talking about? And he said, we want you to brush the bushes when you walk. We've been telling you. And I said, oh, I, I didn't hear any of it. I, can't, I couldn't hear you. He said, you've got to walk right up, stand right in front of me, because I can't see you on the side. There's no peripheral vision. I can't hear you. I'm covered up. You know, you, you're Odo. <laughs> you, right. you gotta you gotta come and talk to me no i said come on renee i would never never you know i don't have a problem i just didn't know mm -hmm. so then we shot it and we got it scott your most prominent star trek role is your most recent one and this one you are the recurring character in eight episodes of star trek enterprise it's one of lily's favorite series mm -hmm. now the makeup is revolutionary and your portrayal of zindi reptilian dolem is superb Tell us about the audition and first stepping onto the set of Star Trek Enterprise to portray Dolan. They contacted me about coming in to read, and they prefaced it with, it's going to be a boatload of makeup and probably a lot of episodes were worn on you up front. I leaned over to Randy, who was Degra, and he's we're, we're talking about this use of this weapon and whether or not to use it. He's basically Oppenheimer and we got the bomb, should we use it, is the theory. So I said to him, I said to Randy, what about this? What about my race hates your race? 
And Randy said, okay, okay. So well, then we played it again, and there wasn't anything racist. I just was really incredibly belittling and dismissive of him, no matter what he said. Would intentionally sort of cut him off before he finished his line. And we started to work this dynamic of r racism. And uh, the writers liked it and wrote right at it that season because they were writing that, that season on the fly a lot. And, uh, uh, and Randy's in my relationship and that whole thing between Dolem and Degra, uh, they loved it. Uh, Manny Cotto was a writer. He cornered me one day and was picking my brain a little bit about stuff. And he, he wrote me some great stuff. I mean, and I did some things as commander Dolem that had never been done on Star Trek before. I mean, I, you know, Spoiler alert, I gut Degra like a fish. Okay, Scott, so I just want to be clear so our viewers know to articulate here. You are a Zindi reptilian, then there's the subspecies Zindi aquatics, Zindi insectoids. Scott, and it was you and Randy Oglesby who came up with the basis of interspecies Zindi racism that the producers and writers rolled with in this roundtable discussion that you're referring to. To a degree. Uh, you know, I just, I just thought they opened it up. They said, you know, it's just kind of laying there, you know, and I remember Brandon saying, you know, it's kind of our fault. We're just, but they were, you know, they were, they were coming up with it on the fly. They were, we, we're not positive which way we're going to go. I think they were making a lot of high level decisions about whether or not they could go against that prime directive, whether or not they could kill people, all of that kind of stuff, because mm -hmm. Trek fans got mad at enterprise. They were mad at enterprise when it was out. They were, and the studio wasn't giving it a lot of love. Uh, that show was the least supported of all of them. That was the kind of the buzz from the cast when we were shooting that season. They're, everybody was wondering if the axe was going to fall on Enterprise that season. Scott, what were some of your favorite moments or lines as the Zindi Reptilian Dollum? Oh, oh I, so they gave me so many great lines to say. <laughs> I mean, that that scene when I kill Randy and I get to deliver that great line, you know, I'm going to end your line, you know, I'm going to end your family. But, uh, and that other great one, when I you or do that again, your skin will adorn the bow of my ship, <laughs> you know? Yeah. What a great thing to get to say on a sci-fi. Right. You know, I was, I, don't know, I was Darth Vader, you know? <laughs> I mean, literally, you know, yeah. if you can't be the captain of the Enterprise, you want to be the villain. Right. And I was. And literally, hand-to-hand -hand combat with the captain of the Enterprise, you know, on the bridge of the Death Star, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, at the very end. It For was sure. so fun. <laughs> so unbelievably fun. I mean, you know, and Scott Bakula was just a treat to work with. I mean, that guy's just a straight-up pro. And Scott, did you do any of the stunts in this rather large costume and makeup, particularly in that last episode as Dolan? I did do the stunts for mo most of the time for Dolan, but there was like, there's one where the guy kind of jumps down into this hole and they brought the stuntman in for that. And there's another one where they're hanging off some kind of guardrail and he's pushing on Bakula's head. Scott, thank you so much for being with Brian and I here on A Captain's Log. It was a pleasure. Live long and prosper to all who are watching. Hello, happy.